Hey, it's Spoonie, and it's time for the May update on the progress of Kitten Space Agency. This game is being developed as the spiritual successor to Kerbal Space Program by Dean Hall and a team at Rocketworks that includes the creator of Kerbal Space Program itself, Harvester. This team also includes influential modders from the KSP community like Blackrack, who also briefly worked on KSP2 over at Intercept Games before the studio was closed down and the game entered the game development void. Since then, KSP2, along with every other game under the private division label, was sold off to a private equity firm called Haveli Investments. And while there are rumors that a new team led by ex Annapurna developers are being spun up to work on games from this basket, there are no guarantees that it will be Kerbal Space Program 2. And frankly, it's just much more likely that the games that are going to be worked on are the two yet unreleased games that were already nearing completion when the label was sold off. If you are just hearing about KSA for the first time, I have put together a quick recap that should bring you up to speed as far as what we know about the game so far and what you'll need to know to better follow along with its development. If you feel like you already know all of this and just want the updates from these past few weeks, just skip ahead to the chapter called New Updates. First, this game is meant to be the spiritual successor to Kerbal Space Program 2. It is being built from the ground up on a custom framework called Brutal designed specifically for this game. Brutal gives the developers full control over just about everything and allows them to quickly experiment with new features and ideas, like shadows from moons on planets which went from conception to proof of concept implementation in just three hours. Yes, there will be mod support. In fact, this game is being developed with mod support as a cornerstone, and everything in the game is essentially a mod itself which can be altered. The game will have multiplayer, and the groundwork for this feature is being baked into the game so that it can be more easily added when the time comes. We don't know if it will launch with this feature, but we do know that they are planning for it. The game will have interstellar travel. The game will also be DRM free, meaning you will not have to have an internet connection to play the game. The game will also, at least ideally, be free to play. This is still a little bit up in the air as the developers will obviously need to make money from the game. It may be through a pay what you want system or other voluntary support. We will have to wait for further clarification down the road, but we do know that Dean Hall very much wants this game to be released for free. While we don't have a lot of information on system requirements just yet, the game seems to already be incredibly performant, with at least some of the work being tested on a 2080 Super at 1440p, often achieving an FPS in the hundreds. This is a good sign that you probably won't need a 5090 to play this game at the higher settings with a decent frame rate. This performance boost is in part thanks to a system of rendering called spherical billboards, which swaps out pre-rendered meshes as you approach an orbital body rather than rendering them in real time you will be able to seamlessly switch from ship view to orbital view or to another ship around another body without the need for loading screens thanks to the utilization of instantiable physics and the brutal framework, which allows everything to play by its own set of rules rather than everything being tied together in a persistent scene. This also gives the modders a straightforward path to adding, editing, or completely remaking systems. And those are the key points which I hope will answer a lot of the questions those who are new to the game might have. The first update came, as always, immediately after I uploaded my last video, and it shows off a feature of the Automatic Transfer Planner which is a work in progress, and will make plotting encounters with a target body much easier than it was in Kerbal Space Program, at least in vanilla KSP. Some of this was possible with MechJeb and a few other mods, but having this built into the vanilla experience will be a welcome change. This update shows off the pork chop plot maps. And I know a lot of you are thinking exactly what I was thinking when I first read that. What is a pork chop? This one I had to Google because the update literally just says pork chops in the automatic transfer planner and then shows a color map. And according to Google, a pork chop here refers to a pork chop plot which are used to explore the trade-offs between different launch and arrival dates for a spacecraft traveling between planets. So it's really useful information if you are trying to build a ship that would be efficiently using its delta V by finding a better launch window or just the most efficient time to burn for your transfers. All around really, really useful information. I do have one cat caveat for this though. I hope that this is a feature for a more advanced module that can be crafted later in the game. I think it takes some of the guesswork, or rather all of the guesswork, out of the experience, which I think is a big part of the charm for early game Kerbal Space Program. You blunder your way to the moon for the first time. But what do you all think? Is having a built-in transfer planner something you would hope to see? Or do you think it's too much hand-holding? I personally really do hope that they stop short of adding in a full-blown MechJeb autopilot type system, as I think it would really hurt the vanilla experience. For me, that's just something better left to the modding community for those that want it. Next, we got an update on some planet textures, and JPL Repo points out that while these are publicly available textures and are being used currently, they are not intended to be part of KSA. The real solar system is also not intended to be the KSA system. 
Although they did say in the town hall that they are most likely going to be using the system for the early access. So for those that want to play around in this real solar system, I think you'll get a chance. But the reason they're using it for now is just that there's a lot of data that already exists, which allows them to test their systems and their models. JP also mentions that this is likely to be the largest scale anyone is likely going to mod in, and I can already hear some of the modding community just thinking, challenge accepted. So I can't wait to see the first moon system that is just one giant planet with a hundred moons, and each of those moons have ten moons of their own. Moonception. I don't have the skills necessary to create a mod like that, but I might take a crack at it. And if I do, expect mediocrity. Speaking of moons, Dean Hall, the CEO of Rocketworks, also posted this picture showing off the KSP moon versus the KSA moon. And I think this picture even does some of the progress they have made on KSA visually a disservice, because this makes Kerbal look a lot more realistic than it actually did in vanilla KSP. Either way, it shows what 10 plus years and building a game from scratch gets you in terms of visuals. Like ray tracing, for example. And this image shows off a still from a demo project for ray tracing reflections within the Brutal framework. It's not implemented yet, but this is something to look forward to, and I expect it is going to allow for some incredible screenshots of ship parts as well as water on planets. We also got another example of physics working during time warp. As you may remember in Kerbal Space Program, if you increased the time warp past a specific threshold, your ship's physics would just become rigid. This was so that the Kraken didn't rip your ship apart. I personally used this all the time to instantly stop my ship from rotating, which was a little bit of a cheat, but whatever, don't judge me. This won't be possible in KSA though. Your ship will still be fully functional and affected by physics under any level of time warp. In this case, they are demonstrating the Jen Beckoff effect, also known as the tennis racket effect. This occurs when an object that is not perfectly balanced is spinning and suddenly flips its axis repeatedly while maintaining the direction of its spin. This isn't as noticeable on Earth because of all of that pesky gravity and friction, but in space, it's kind of hard to miss. Basically, this is just a really cool demonstration of functioning Newtonian physics within Brutal, and it's going to be a lot of fun to see this effect under full time warp. Those separated boosters that you used to be able to just time warp away from just got a whole lot more dangerous. We also were shown some images of some updated textures, and although these are still a work in progress, they show off systems for generating various biomes, each with their own materials, surface, and cliff textures. While this one might seem a bit subtle, and it is pointed out that the moon may not be the best example case due to the grayscale and therefore less noticeable biome diversity, these are big changes which give the various planets and moons much more visual depth. I am really looking forward to seeing these demonstrated on Mars and other more colorful planets where biomes might be more distinct. Adding on to this, we also got a look at terrain tessellation and displacement, which is what gives textures small details when you get up close like rocks and other debris. What we are seeing here is a bit larger than what the finished product will be, and that is so that it can be more easily worked on and then scaled down. And we can also see some vertex shimmering, but again this is a work in progress, but it gives us a better idea of what the surfaces of planetary bodies might look like once we actually manage to land on them. It's really incredible work from Lynx here, and I can't wait to see the finished product. This next update is a simple quality of life addition, but it is something that I and many others have asked for, and that is a button that instantly zooms you out to the map view. Before, when the transition from ship to map was shown, it's been through literally just scrolling over time. And while I am really glad that this is a seamless thing, I am also really glad that we won't have to wear out our mouse wheels every time we launch a mission. We are also finally getting to see some previous updates be combined and come together. Blackrack shared some of his work on volumetric renderings of RCS thrusters and what they look like on the Apollo command module. This command module is being used for testing purposes, and we still haven't been shown any of the actual in-game parts yet. But I have a feeling that is going to change pretty soon. To further demonstrate just how great these look, we can see here the real-life reference for what RCS thrusters look like on an actual rocket ship. A few days later, we were given a second update for these, and we can see a little more detail here, like some coloring closer to the exhaust bezel on the RCS thruster. Blackrack also explained that by using a volumetric approach to plumes for engines and RCS rather than a particle effect, they are able to achieve great looking plumes that are also more performant than rendering in large number of particles for each engine. And what is probably the biggest update this month, we are getting multi-window rendering. This is something that I know a lot of people have asked about in the comments and on Discord. And the answer is yes, there will be multi-window support and rendering. This means that you can have multiple views of a single vessel open, a view of a moon and some other planet, or maybe even just a command module and a lander both open at the same time. There are a lot of use cases here. I personally will probably use it to keep an IVA view open while landing, so that I can actually see what a successful landing looks like in IVA. But more importantly, this opens up a lot of avenues for modders as they will be able to create peripherals for the game that require their own window. Flight sims and flight sim enthusiasts use this type of thing for multifunction displays. In other words, it is going to be entirely possible to create a functioning at-home cockpit complete with instruments on multifunction displays for those who decide to treat KSA more like a flight sim than a space exploration game. 
For me, I just like the idea of being able to use my second monitor as a dedicated IVA or instrument panel. So this is just great news for everybody. Don't forget to give this video a massive thumbs up. It really helps my channel a lot. And be sure to subscribe to stay up to date with the development of Kitten Space Agency and several other games. Leave a comment and let me know what you think about this month's updates. Also, so far, what about KSA has you the most excited? Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.